There are a lot of myths about hyperbaric oxygen floating around out there, and today I want to talk about the five most common myths that I hear, questions that I get about hyperbaric oxygen. I want to correct those myths and make sure that the information being put out there is accurate. We're going to cover that in this video. Myth number one, only high pressure hyperbarics works. We've covered some of these concepts in other videos, so please take a look around. But a summary of this would be all hyperbaric therapy works. How do we know that? We know that because there are gas laws and there are physiologic rules that govern this entire process. And so what we know is that oxygen is critical for cellular function, and we are limited to the amount that we can get because of atmospheric pressure and the percentage of oxygen that we're breathing. So as soon as we increase atmospheric pressure and we change the dynamic of how we're pulling that oxygen from our atmosphere, from our environment, and delivering that increased oxygen to our cells, we are effectively changing physiology. We should absolutely expect changes and benefits as a result of that increased oxygen. So whether that's 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.5, 2.0, 2.4, the number will change the total amount of oxygen. Absolutely. The total number will change the dose of oxygen, will change the speed that these effects and benefits show up for a patient, but it doesn't mean that that's the only way to do it. The only way to do it is to increase atmospheric pressure above what you and I are acclimated to. And as soon as that change occurs, we have changes in our physiology. It is certainly not that only hard chambers at high pressure works and lower pressure doesn't. That is not the case. On the flip side of that, the next myth is that soft chambers or mild pressure can do everything that hard chambers and higher pressure can do. And again, that is absolutely not true. And we did cover a lot of this in other videos about differences between different pressures and what their effects are on our bodies. But let's just summarize that to say mild pressures create more mild effects. They still increase atmospheric pressure and you can still increase the percentage of oxygen that the patient is breathing, which means when you combine an increased amount of atmospheric pressure with an increased percentage of oxygen, you can multiply those two numbers together and that is the pressure of oxygen. So the total pressure times the percentage of oxygen gives you the actual dosage of oxygen, the pressure of oxygen, and that pressure of oxygen is the driving force for absorption. And so, yes, I just finished saying that as soon as we have that increased pressure of oxygen, we're changing physiology. However, the total amount of pressure and the total percentage of oxygen, and then of course the total amount of sessions, the frequency, the duration, all of those factors combine to give you the total effect that you're going to have on the patient. So if you did 30 hours of treatment in a 1.3 atmospheric environment, and you did 30 hours of treatment at a 2.4 atmospheric environment, you should not expect the same results. And anyone claiming that you would get the same results is certainly not giving you accurate information. Those are obviously two very different therapies which are going to result in two very different results. It doesn't mean that one is going to be effective and the other one isn't. It just means that they're going to be different. But certainly we need to respect this concept and we have to respect this conversation enough to say that higher pressure is great and does do certain things. Mild pressure is great. It does do certain things, but they are not the same and shouldn't be compared to one another in that way. Within those same first two myths or within those same first two conversations, there's this concept that could I just make up for in time what I'm lacking in pressure? Let's just use two specific treatment protocols. At 1.5 atmospheres, which is equivalent to saying seven and a half PSI or seven and a half pounds per square inch versus 2.0 atmospheres or 14.7, almost 15 PSI. So let's just say that 1.5 is about half of the pressure of 2.0. So does that mean that if I did, let's say, 20 sessions at 2.0, I would have the exact same exposure or result as if I did 40 sessions at 1.5? We can't say that either. Could we get closer? Could we say that the total number of units of oxygen at that 2.0 for 20 sessions would be basically the same number unit of oxygen as it would be of 1.5. Would that equal the exact same effect? We can't say that. Is it possible that that's true? Yes. Do we have any research to support that? We don't. Ultimately, we know that the higher pressure will deliver certain results that the lower pressure is likely not to deliver. 
Yeah. At the same time, are there certain issues or concerns that are still going to do better at lower pressures than they would at higher pressures? I think that that's true. I think that the research showing a lot of work on brain rehabilitation from TBI and concussion show 1.5 or 1.7, those numbers might be actually, even though they're lower, they might be superior in terms of the results than something like 2.0 or 2.2. Can we compare the two? We really can't. We can measure the units and make a comparison to try to make an equal protocol, but we can't guarantee that those results are going to be the same, and likely they won't be. And within that same conversation, I would say that just because more pressure does deliver more oxygen, it doesn't mean that every patient should get the most possible. And in many cases, that's not true. These moderate ranges, especially that 1.5 range for, let's say, brain recovery, is likely to end up being superior than higher pressures because it's a safer way to deliver oxygen specifically to the brain. Myth number three, soft chambers don't work. Now, we have done other videos on this as well, but to summarize that, let's just say this. The material is irrelevant. It's not a soft material or a hard material like the material actually creates any of the changes or benefits. It's just an enclosure that allows pressure to build. The pressure of a soft chamber in the U.S. will be 1.3 atmospheres. Again, it's about 30% more atmospheric pressure than what I'm getting right now at sea level. Does that work? The summary is, of course it does. It's 30% more oxygen delivered to your cells, which is going to create increased metabolic rate, increased ATP production, improved immune response. We know that for sure. Is it going to give you everything that the higher pressure is going to give you? No, and we shouldn't claim that it does. But to say that it doesn't work, is also completely inaccurate. Myth number four, oxygen is toxic. So while oxygen is amazing, you need it every second of every day and you're replenishing it every second of every day just to even sit here and listen to this video. There are times where more oxygen is necessary. In other words, you're getting as much oxygen as you could possibly get right now. Your red blood cells, if you're healthy, should be 100% saturated. So the only way for you to get more oxygen than what you're getting right now would be to be exposed to increased atmospheric pressure. So we increase your atmospheric pressure, we increase the pressure of oxygen, we drive more oxygen into your body. That allows for an improved performance, improved cellular performance, improved cellular ATP or energy production. That's an amazing thing. And as a result, there are many, many benefits to those hyperbaric exposures. But just like anything else, any other therapy that has a clinical benefit to it, there are also potential consequences. And at really high levels, oxygen does become toxic. There's two types of oxygen toxicity. We covered these very specifically in two different videos, one on central nervous system oxygen toxicity, which is a very high dosage of oxygen in a very short period of time. Typically in a clinical environment, in a hyperbaric environment, that's going to be a pressure of oxygen of 2.0 or more, where the risk of oxygen toxicity starts to elevate. The other type, we did a video on pulmonary oxygen toxicity. Pulmonary oxygen toxicity is not about a large amount of oxygen in a short period of time. It's about a moderate amount of oxygen over a really long period of time. And so you need to understand how many units, I was referring to units of oxygen before. If you took the atmospheric pressure that they were exposed to, multiplied it by the percentage of oxygen that they were breathing, and you multiplied that by the number of minutes that they were getting it, that's going to give you a value. That value is called oxygen tolerance units. There's a certain number of oxygen tolerance units that's considered safe and another number of oxygen units that now is starting to become dangerous. And so if you want more information on oxygen toxicity, check out those two videos, but just also know that you need to calculate what exposures you're getting or what exposures your patients are getting to know this is the line of where pulmonary oxygen toxicity begins. This is the amount of oxygen that I exposed them to in this therapy session. Therefore, I know that this was a safe exposure for them. It's actually not a myth that oxygen is toxic. It's actually very true that oxygen has the capacity to be toxic, but there are also very well-defined lines to avoid central nervous system oxygen toxicity and to avoid pulmonary oxygen toxicity, knowing that you can expose somebody to increased oxygen levels, improve their benefits, improve their ability to heal and regenerate cells and tissues, and at the same time, keep it well below those thresholds that you're keeping your patients safe. Myth number five, hyperbaric oxygen is dangerous. Hyperbaric oxygen is inherently safe. There are thousands of chambers doing hundreds of sessions every month. And thank God, the number of accidents that occur are very, 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 very low. That's because hyperbaric is inherently a safe therapy. At the same time, there are definite rules and regulations that need to be known and followed well 
in order to maintain and keep the industry safe. Pressure changes physiology. Increased percentages of oxygen change physiology. Increased pressure and increased percentages of oxygen become potentially hazardous as an environment in terms of, let's say, fires or sparks. And so you need to understand what equipment you're running or the equipment that the place that you're going to is running. You need to know what steps are being taken to keep you safe. Because while inherently it is safe, and typically it requires many things to go wrong all at the same time for really catastrophic events to occur, you certainly don't want to be involved in one of those events. And so knowing where those lines are, knowing what the rules and regulations are, following the rules and regulations of hyperbaric oxygen will help keep this industry safe for eternity. Keep your clinic safe, keep your staff safe, keep your patients safe, or if you are the patient, keeping you safe. And so being aware of the fact that it, while it's inherently safe, making sure that everybody knows the rules, is following the rules, and is keeping the guidelines in check, doing maintenance on the equipment, logging their maintenance, keeping the areas clean. These are all really important pieces of maintaining a safe environment. While it's inherently safe, so much of the work that we're doing, especially when we're teaching our courses, we're helping clinics implement hyperbaric inside their offices, is to help keep this industry safe so that we don't have any of these catastrophic events or ultimately even a minor injury to a patient. Because these are going to be long-term relationships with patients in your office, patients need to have positive, healthy experiences in your office. They need to want to come for therapy. And so it's not just avoiding the catastrophic issues. It's also keeping the patients happy and comfortable so that they're willing and able to commit to the long-term treatment plan and ultimately get the results that you want them to have and of course, the results that they want to have. Those are the five myths of hyperbaric oxygen. I hope you found that information helpful. If you did, please click like and subscribe. That helps other people with these same questions find us so that we can help answer more questions for more people and get this information out there. Appreciate your time. We'll see you next time.